we, I suppose in order to get into it, what I should do is just take a moment or two to actually describe for you my idea or my uh, account of what it is that lies at the very center, uh, or at least as far into the center as I've been able to push of these experiences. Uh, to my mind, uh, I, I mean, I mentioned here this morning that DMT seems to me the most powerful of these things. What powerful means in that context is that more of the motifs are present at greater energy than they are uh, in some of these other compounds. And, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, what happens to most people, I think, if they are able to remember it, uh, what an actual DMT flash is like is, uh, you know, you it, this stuff, it's vaporized in a glass pipe, it's smoked, it comes on in about half a minute or less and is immensely stronger than any amount of psilocybin or LSD could conceivably be, I think. And what happens is, uh, and I'll speak in the first person just to make it manageable, uh, uh, what happens is I break into uh, a space, first of all, I am fully myself. In other words, I am exactly who I was before. That's why on one level I say DMT doesn't affect your mind. You are not euphoric, ecstatic. You are exactly who you were before. But there is a sense of pushing through a membrane of some sort. There's actually a sound as though someone had wadded up a cellophane bread wrapper, that crackling sound which some people assumed erroneously were brain cells frying in your cerebellum. A friend of mine said, it's, it's your soul as radio intellect leaving your body through the top of your head. Well, whatever it is, you burst into a space, I burst into a space that is uh, inhabited. That's the first shocker is there is no ambiguity about it because there's an ear-splitting cheer as you break into this space. It's an elf nest of some sort. <laughs> and there are hundreds of these self-dribbling jeweled basketballs, sort of. I mean, that's a heavy download into English of what they are. But they are autonomous, separate from the background, and they bound forward, screaming hello, basically. And um, for someone who expected insight into their relationship or their financial circumstances, <laughs> this is a fairly off, you know, a fairly astonishing and rapid turn of development. And, uh, and they are intently focused upon you. I mean, when it happens to me, they, 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 they yell hooray, and then they are like long lost acquaintances. They literally pour over you. They crawl over you. You're being hugged by a troop of hyperspatial machine elves and they say you know you stay away so long you send so many but you come so rarely uh, and we're so happy to see you and then and there is a sense of being somehow without being able to cognize the logic of it you're underground you can tell that you're far underground and these things the main thing going on in this place is that these things are creatures of language. They are elves of syntactical intent. They appear to be made of language, not matter. And they are in a process of continuous semantic transformation. Meaning is crawling across their surfaces in a state of continual metamorphosis. And they are, uh, 
emitting sounds roughly analogous to some kind of, of music or language, except that this is like no music or language you've ever heard, because what it is, is it is something capable of being visibly apprehended. It's sound which you can see. It's linguistic structure whose syntax is visible in three-dimensional space. And they um, use their voices to make objects, which are, in some sense, the central focus of the experience. Because out of the air, out of their bodies, out of your body, they condense, create, and pluck these objects which they offer for your inspection. And as you lean forward to look at one of these things, midst this clamor of elf hysteria, you, as I said, are fully yourself. Your judgment is not impaired. You're, and, and in fact, they are saying to you, fight excitement. Do not abandon yourself to amazement. In other words, they're telling you, stay down. Don't just go off on some arm-waving rave about how this is impossible and outlandish and outrageous. Try to stay focused on what we're doing. And what they show you are objects that are intrinsically and inherently impossible. So that these things made of tools, gold, ivory, cut stone, flesh, music, hope, odor, I mean, it's hard to talk about, but when you direct your attention towards these things, you can tell by looking at it that if you could get it into three-dimensional space, if I could suddenly whip one out of my briefcase and display it to you, our world, our intellectual constructs would collapse upon themselves because this is impossible, impossibly beautiful, impossibly constructed, defying of the laws of physics and of chemistry. So is, is there a, a do you think there's a multi-dimensional life force that is the same through the entire dimension? And that is a, that's a higher dimension, actually, maybe from the future, maybe, I mean, as, as far as three-dimensional time is concerned, there is no such thing. Well, besides what we've created, so are they actually trying to tell you that, okay, everything you see is impossible is not really impossible. Introducing to you that nothing is impossible and that that is our future way of thinking, is that nothing is impossible any longer, otherwise we're doomed. Well, I have a sort of an, I almost said rational, but let's say at least orderly kind of mind. So I, I tried to understand, you know, what could this be? So you make a list of hypotheses and then think about each hypothesis and test it against the evidence. Okay, hypothesis one, DMT is not a drug. It is an extraterrestrial communication device. These are creatures somewhere in the universe who are so different from us that they come to us not in starships the size of Manhattan, but in drug molecules uh, that are dinky. So uh, we are in contact here with some kind of extraterrestrial technology, and these are true aliens of some sort. And God knows the weirdness of the situation supports the hypothesis. Okay, second hypothesis. Uh, there is a parallel universe unsuspected by most human beings. It's right here all the time. It's inhabited. These things have their own hopes, fears, problems, so forth. And somehow this drug just erases this boundary and then you're, you find yourself in the elf nest. Okay, next hypothesis. These things, because they have great affection for me, because they seem intent on the, prog on the task of communicating, perhaps they are uh, human beings from the distant future. Perhaps this is what we are fated to become, 
you know, there's always, since we were kids, the cliché, beings of pure energy. Well, it's always been a little hard to wrap your mind around what that would look like, but lo and behold, here appear to be creatures of pure energy. Uh, but there are a lot of problems with hypothesizing a future human technological breakthrough which would allow them to actually manipulate the past. Uh, logical paradoxes and that sort of thing. Uh, well, so then here's another possibility. They are human beings, but they are not in the future in the ordinary sense or in the past. They are in the prenatal and post-life phase. In other words, these are either the, the unborn it waiting in some limbo-like dimension to descend into matter, or they are, in fact, uh, people who have had a sojourn in the domain of organic existence and now have moved on. Let me not kid you, we're talking about dead people here in that case. Well, if you go to the if you go to the shamans who, who access these places through ayahuasca or the varola snuffs or something like that, they will say, uh, well, these are ancestors. Didn't you read Mersiliad? Don't you know that shamanism works through ancestor magic? Well, ancestor is a tremendously sanitized term for dead people. And if what is actually happening here is that the much argued about soul is actually made visible by this pharmacological strategy, I mean, God knows why, but God knows why anything else is the way it is, then this is truly big news. This is the confounding of rationalism. If what is happening is that by pushing the frontiers of pharmacology, we discover a way to even momentarily and temporarily erase the boundary between the living and the dead, then this is a 180 degree turn on the evolution of culture that not even the most uh, technically infatuated among us are prepared to assimilate. I mean, it's no, it's no challenge on that scale of things to expect visitors from Zenebel Ganubi or Zeta Reticuli or some other distant piece of real estate, but to expect visitors from, uh, you know, beyond the grave that's a little confounding. And over time, I've sort of come to incline to the idea that this is what is in fact going on. And the reason it's so hard to bring anything out of the DMT flash is because at the center of the flash, you find out something so unexpected, so appalling, and so existentially convincing in the moment of confronting it, that you simply immediately block it out and obliterate it. And then, and, and these things are very focused on getting you to do what they're doing. I mean, they say, you can do what we are doing. Do it. Do it. And what they want you to do is use your voice to make objects appear in visual space as though language, admittedly the phenomenon with which we are involved in a way that no other animal species on this planet is, but that language as practiced by human beings is an incomplete enchantment and that pushed to its limits, language becomes not something heard with the ears, but something seen with the eyes on the brink, potentially, through pharmacological re-engineering of ourselves and, and through studying of these shamanic states of mind, about to move into a domain where we see each other's thoughts. Now, normally when we conceive of telepathy, we think of it as, uh, you hear what I think. Telepathy is, you see what I mean. You see, telepathy is a function which goes on in the domain of seeing, not of hearing. And 
why this is important, rather than just some weird psychic ability, uh, is because our boundaries are based on our relationship to our language. If you could see what I mean, in a fairly profound sense, you would be me. In a much more profound sense than when you hear what I say. Because, think about it for a minute, analyze what normal, ordinary communication is. I want to communicate with you. I consult my internal dictionary and I carefully choose words out of my dictionary and I string them together according to the rules of English syntax. I then activate, uh, if I've done things in the right order, I then activate my vocal apparatus. I impart a vibration, an acoustical wave, onto the surrounding medium, which is air. This vibration moves across space. It enters through the holes on both sides of your head as a pressure wave. You then, analyzing this incoming waveform, rush to your dictionary and you break up this incoming wave signature and attempt to map it to words in your dictionary. Now, if your dictionary and my dictionary are the same, then you will, lo and behold, reconstruct my thought in the confines of your brain-mind system. But notice the caveat that was slipped in there. If your dictionary and my dictionary are the same. But they never are. I mean, maybe they are if you ask, can you tell me what time it is, or would you please turn down the stereo? But if you're talking about anything of interest, depth, ambiguity, or complexity, then chances are uh, your dictionary and my dictionary only generally uh, assimilate to congruency with each other. So then uh, ambiguity creeps in. You think you understand. I think you understand. And on that shaky foundation, we begin to build further semi-understandings. And then we drift off in the general direction of misapprehension eventually. Well, if you could see what I mean, there would be no ambiguity in our communication because uh, uh, we would, the intention of language would be established in visual space with an existential modality about it similar to sculpture. I would make it, but having made it, you and I would both examine it, walk around it, and have the faith that we were looking at the same thing. And this would tend to erase our boundaries. So it's very clear that communication of the ordinary sort, small mouth noises transduced across acoustical space and symbolic notations thereof, have created the global civilization that we're living inside of. But how much more collectivist how much more community we would have if we could see what each other mean. And so I, uh, I'm beginning to assume that the proper way to think about these hallucinogens is as catalysts for language formation, as catalysts for the project of communication, and that the end result of the, of the project of communication is that we become what we behold.